Hello, Caviar Dreamers. Hi, Caviar Dreamers. We are back and better than before because we are moved into our mm-hmm. almost renovated office. But check out the wallpaper. A little sneak peek, feeling very socialite chic today. Yes, I wore we're tassels very- and seasick or neon. We're very socialite And you know what? It's very Palm Beachy. And we're feeling it. We are feeling it. And the AC isn't working, so it feels like fucking Palm Springs. <laughs> Hot as fuck. I mean, whoo, man. And Joe is an HVAC guy. Everybody's air conditioner is broken because this house is very large and we have a lot of systems and one system is broken. The system that's broken does this room. Yeah. And, and my main level. Yeah. And it's not getting delivered till tomorrow morning. So it's not a good situation so here. just got to suck it up. I know. And in the morning, it's been cool. It's the sun. It comes right through the windows in the afternoon, and it's a killer. But we should not complain about the sun because we don't see it for a lot of the year. And then mm-hmm, when it comes mm-hmm. back, we should just and be happy. And guess what? We are going to have window treatments, which you guys will be seeing, you know, on the show, whatever. Uh, you know, because you guys will be seeing a renovation finally. So no more complaining when you see me and Joe on the street. Hey, Joe, when's your house going to be done? So, Joe, when is the house going to be done? No. <laughs> exactly, Joe. Fix the fucking house. No. Listen, my dad was a contractor, so I lived it. You are always last on the list. Cause yes, there's always but we, a job but we have got a lot to. done, so that's the one good thing COVID's been good for. P.S. I even have a wig on, um, half a weave on, because I can't even get my hair done to I'm such a train wreck. But the my girls, how are the COVID. girls settling in? Last week Ooh, we were from girl. the bed. This week you made it to the uh, to the office. I have, um, you can't see them here. I have them in a t-shirt. My boobs are very hard. I do not have implants, like I said. I have uh, all natural all boob material, girls. all my own girls <laughs> in here. Natural boob material. It is. It's natural boob fat material uh, that I had so much that I didn't even need an implant when I got them lifted, and they're really big still. Domestically made. Domestically made. They are. They look like the boob of a 20-year-old, which I'm very blessed. I'm so, so jealous. Now, now um, from the boob up, you know, I look much younger, but from the boob down, it's not so good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? From the boob uh, down. Like... like no, I don't think so. I see you naked all the time. You don't look bad from the boob down. I don't know. From the boob down, it's not so good. But I'm very happy with the boobs. Very happy with the knockers. And you're going to go see the doctor tomorrow. I'm Do going to see the up. doctor tomorrow. But I, check if the anybody progression just, of the boobs. You can't see, but they're bru- You can't even see, but they're good. They're good. They're great. They're, they're hard, which is really weird. It, you know, implants are hard, but they're very firm, I think, because they're swollen. It's the swollen. I keep touching them. but And I just came from the gynecologist and... How was that? How was the pipes downstairs? seemed good? Everything downstairs was good. Okay, good. The so, AC's working down there. The AC was working down there. Joe has had time to check those pipes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think Joe's a little bit of a freak because <laughs> he made me have sex with him <laughs> with these chopped up boobs that look like Raggedy Ann right now. So wow, it's like a Tim Burton movie, like all stitched together, like a Nightmare Before Christmas. I mean, he really is a nut bar. <laughs> But with that being said, we have a great episode today. Oh, I'm really looking forward to talking to this person who has gr- become a great friend, even though we met through the entertainment industry yes, and the we watch going on the show. The fabulous Dave Quinn, formerly of People Magazine, because he's left People Magazine, but we'll let you, he'll tell you why. And he has very exciting news, and I'm sure his journey is so interesting, and I'm sure he has some fun celebrity stories along the way because really I think to some of his career you can't make this shit up with the people no and he's so great and I love him and he gives such a great interview and he's so warm and he's so loving but you know he has to tell the facts and I'm sure it's sometimes hard for him when he really cares about somebody and he has to tell you know the the dirty truth and it's fun to be on the other side we'll see how Mm -hmm. he does when we're grilling him today yes so here we go where's our little Davey let's bring in Dave Davey. Hi. Beautiful as always. I love that wallpaper. Thank you. Uh, It's the new and improved office. Oh my gosh. It looks so good. I can't wait to see it in person. Oh, wait. Wait till you come over. The house is really underway. I'm so excited. And, you know, even amidst all this COVID, the fact that you're able to get that done is pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, his name is Joe and he's been (laughs) fucking trapped. So he happens to be very good at wallpaper. So there's nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to go, Dave. Nowhere else to go. Well, we're so happy to have you here. I'm thrilled. I I just said we have Dave Quinn, formerly, you know, big journalist at People Magazine. 
and now you know you're in the hot seat you you left people we didn't we didn't say why but you know we have to do the evolution of the Dave Quinn career that's right yes I'll fill you all in on it <laughs> what a career I mean we were, I was saying before you know you really can't make up the shit that you've had to write about over the years it is literally insanity it is nuts and I and it is very much a be careful what you wish for sort of thing right because I always had dreams of what I wanted to do and things that I was passionate about. And when I started to get to do them and started to believe in them, it only got harder and harder. <laughs> only started this phone continued to ring and ring and ring with you crazy ladies coming after me all the time. So I was like, all right. I know. All right. Everyone's like, Dave, why did you write that? I didn't say that, Dave. <laughs> Dave, what the fuck? I know. Everyone's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I'm sure it's also very hard when you like somebody, but you have to tell the hard, honest truth. Right. And, you know, as a journalist, the joy of being able to uh, to do your job is being able to tell as much of the truth as you can. So I was really lucky to pair myself with a publication like People that really cared about that and where my opinion didn't really matter as much because I was always able to stand behind, well, this is what was said on the show or this is what this person feels and not what I truly think about it. I know. It yeah, People <laughs> is, was, is like the sophisticated you know, publication. Yeah. I think you, it's not, it's not tabloidish. That's what was no. said, which no, I love no, no. people. It's like when you read it in people, you believe it. It's the yes. truth. It's not like, you know, it's not like hardcore gossip. It's, it's just like, you know, you're getting the facts. That's right. the way I always looked at people magazine. Ooh, there's people let's get, you know, it's like, yeah. you always feel like you're getting the real truth. So Dave, and that's how I felt as a kid reading it as well, right? It mm -hmm. was like always the coolest thing. And I would do the crossword in the back of the book all the time. <laughs> I know, I know. So tell me, Dave, like growing up, did you want to be a journalist? Like what did you want to do as like a little kid? Little baby Dave Quinn, growing up. <laughs> I was really a theater kid. I grew up here in New York. And I remember my parents were obsessed with the Les Miserables cast recording from the 80s. And I used to listen to it all the time on repeat with them. So one day they took me to see the show and I couldn't believe that the entire thing was done live. Like it blew my mind away that these people showed up and like did this performance. And I was so curious. I remember one of the actresses like made eye contact with me in the audience. And I was so curious about what it meant to be on that side of the fence. So from a really young age, I was interested in hearing those sorts of stories and interested in showbiz in some way. And I went to school and uh, really fell into, in high school, into working for the newspaper. I loved being able to like help tell stories. And all throughout college, that's what I was doing as well. And slowly kind of was able to marry both my love for journalism with my love for uh, celebrity. But I always wanted to be involved in theater in some capacity. And I studied theater in college simply to understand how to write about it, how to criticize it, how to really look at it. And that's how my career really started as a theater uh, critic. Wow. So what was your first job? My first job, well, my first ever job was actually working at The Gap. <laughs> I was a retail <laughs> you were, you were kid. You were folding. I was folding, but I got celebrities in that because I worked at The Gap in, uh, in Manhasset, Long Island at the time. Oh, yeah. And, and um, uh, J-Lo lived right there, and so did LL Cool J, and they would come in all the time, and it was like this crazy experience of now, helping did, did celebrities. Did J-Lo, J-Lo, was, uh, was she on Fly Girls then, or was she like very famous then? <laughs> she was like beginning to peak. She was married to Mark Anthony, and they lived in that sort of- Oh, uh, so she so looked like, good already. She looked amazing, and she came in with like a personal shopper, and it was like for the kids- and uh, and the same thing with L Cool J, you know, was was very established, but his wife would come in all the time and just like waiting on them <laughs> as like a retail kid. It was so crazy just like having that marriage. But again, I learned a ton in retail and I have to say yeah. retail is what got me my job. Retail, I learned skills that are completely transferable to everything I'm still doing today. I agree. You know yeah. what? And I think now people who are in retail, half of them suck. <laughs> it's true. It's a agree? very hard the job. The customer experience has totally changed. The value yes. has changed. Like I worked in the Gap in college too. And I won yes. the cashmere sweaters. You know when you have to do the sweater challenge? Of as the course. queen of the cashmere. Yes. I loved it. But don't you feel like you went to work, you showed up to work, no. and they told you like how you needed to engage with people, how important it was to make people feel, to listen. 
right? Those were all super important things to ask um, questions that didn't have yes or no answers. So just, so not to say, you know, can I help you? But to say, what size are you looking for? Like just those sorts of little lessons at 15, 16 years old really taught me how to communicate with all different types of people, whether it would be JLo coming in or whether it would be, you know, a stressed mom um, who needed something really fast or somebody who was in a bad mood. Like you learn to kind of pivot your personality to all their different moods yes and to so deliver bad news you. with a smile <laughs> <laughs> i can't return that sorry i know I, oh god that's a good thing bad news with a smile that's yeah. true that's a good that's a good lesson that's a good lesson so how long so what was your first journalist job my first journalism job was really working in college uh, on my uh, student newspaper. Student I started newspaper. that my freshman year and ended up an editor-in-chief of it by my senior year. And that was a super cool experience because it was a weekly. And working in weeklies are very different. Now, this is way before the internet began. But you're working in a weekly uh, newspaper. You're really turning over what's happening every single week. And it's intense. It's a really tough schedule. Um, and it's funny because People is a weekly as well. So I ended up kind of falling back into that later on. Um, but that was my first taste of it. And from there, I, was, I went to school in Providence. I went to Providence College up in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And after I finished my education there, I stayed and I worked for a couple of local magazines at the time that were based in Providence doing all their theater reporting. So it was a really good way right into my career early on. I, that was good. So now, wait. So now you get to people and at people where they immediately like, you're going to be covering the reality space, you're going to be doing this. Was that like your first thing you did at people? No. Um, so it's super interesting. At people, they have different beats. Everything is kind of built into sections. So there's uh, their verticals that are handling television, verticals that are handling movies and music. And I was actually hired as a freelance writer working on the news team. So I was handling it all. Every morning I would show up. I worked on the morning shift. So I'd show up at like 6.30 or whatever. And it was whatever story was coming your way. You could be dealing with a celebrity death. You could be dealing with a human interest story, a crime story. I was calling up the police and asking for copies of police reports. I was uh, writing about, you know, the latest music video release, uh, transcribing important interviews that were happening mm -hmm. on morning TV. It was, you were kind of a man for all seasons there. And that was super helpful because I had worked in similar experiences prior to that, but it really kept me on my toes and taught me how to write. I mean, at people, they're writing articles every, your deadlines are 15 minutes. I mean, it's fast. Fast. Wow. Yeah. So you have to stay on top of it and be really, really quick. You have to learn how to be a very clean writer, say things, you know, uh, factually, quickly, take your emotions out of it, but still help tell a story. It was an amazing, amazing experience those early, early days. But yeah. they didn't have anybody who was doing anything with housewives there. So I started to poke around and realize that there was an opening that I could kind of wiggle my way into. And they also didn't have anybody who was an experienced theater journalist. That's, oh, that's so interesting. So when you decided you were going to cover housewives. Yes. It actually it began by uh, tackling recaps. Every single episode, they want to have a, a recap of the episode that publishes that evening. And there was a couple of freelancers who were working on recaps. And one of them one day got sick. And they said, oh, Perfect. we need someone to cover New York. And I was like, oh, hi, yeah. I can do it. I'm ready. And that's how I started kind of tipping into uh, that world. I did one. They really liked it. I kind of stayed on it for the next couple of weeks. That writer was excited to not have to do it anymore because it was more like a chore for them. I was excited to take it up. I came in that job as a sponge because I knew that as a freelancer, I could stay a freelancer forever, but I wanted full time. I wanted to be on staff. And the only thing that kept running through my mind is this Oprahism. <laughs> it's so crazy, but I was an Oprah viewer Tell all me. my life. Yes. I, who doesn't love Oprah? Who doesn't love Oprah? And this Oprahism of make yourself invaluable. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. That's said, why. That's why what? That's why Lexi is invaluable. <laughs> yes. Lexi, Lexi is invaluable immediately because I can't do anything without Lexi. <laughs> no, so, it's true. That was a lot, that's a theme that's gone through my career too. Make sure that you're really adding value to every situation at work. Yeah, it was actually something that like I applied even to retail. It's things that I applied in between. Bella like, wants I to always... say hi. She could oh, probably hi, smell Bella. peanut across the <laughs> belt. Say hi. 
<laughs> it's something that I always wanted to make sure that I was doing. I wanted to make sure that I was invaluable, that nobody could do what I could do. And if I proved that to them, then they would hopefully give me full time, which they eventually did. So I was working really hard to source things that nobody was paying attention to, um, to you know, know that I had this love for for these shows that I could bring this historical information to that nobody was aware of and really just establish myself in that career. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you killed it. Everybody knew yeah. who you were. I did my first season. Everyone's like, you got to go to Dave Quinn right away. <laughs> but then you would also interview different cast members. Yeah. So that started to grow after, you know, once you're in the midst of the recap, you start paying attention to everything that's happening in the season. So I would then start flagging stories to the editors and saying, Hey, I know that, you know, you're handling the TV section and you probably didn't realize this, but this thing happened. And it, a lot of times it's things that are happening on Instagram, little fights that are going on, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody may have announced a new line of whatever it may be business wise, or they may have announced that they got engaged. And I was really paying attention to the beat, like a traditional beat reporter, just thinking about every aspect of it, making sure that I was on top of things before the competition. So I started writing more articles. I started being the person who was flagging everything for them and soon became the person who was just managing the beat fully. I would say, oh, we should really interview Margaret because this new Margaret girl just came on New Jersey and I think she's really interesting. She's got a great story about how she navigated you know, uh, through divorce. And I think it would be so fascinating to write a feature on that. And they'd say, yeah, sure. Whatever. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Whatever. Yeah, That's yeah, seriously yeah. the way it was. And I, I started building that more and more. Now, what would happen like if a housewife calls you up or somebody calls you up and they're pissed off at you? Did you get a, ever like a lot of pissed off phone calls? I didn't get as many pissed off phone calls because usually by the time I was writing about it, it was very, um, like looked through like everybody the housewife knew it was happening the publicist knew it was happening i don't do a lot of reporting that's a surprise to anyone i don't do a lot of back-end source reporting that's you know damaging to hurt people it's always like no you definitely don't happen. you were never nothing that like was never that. me but there were times the housewives called me upset and usually it was about something happening in their life uh maybe Danielle Staub would call me and she was yes. frustrated about something happening on the show and she wanted to help tell her story. And there's a lot, this is where all that retail training comes in because you really have to listen to people and, and as, absorb the emotion that they're giving you and help get them through this because everybody has a story to tell whether you believe it to be true or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Which I think is so, I know people would, would call you, they'd use you as like a little, like a therapist almost. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I started to gain this, uh, I, I, think, I can't remember who told it to me. It may have been one of the Potomac ladies, but I started to gain this reputation amongst the housewives as the Olivia Pope of house. Do you know, I have been enjoying HelloFresh. Mr. B is very happy in our house. Well, thank God, because you never really cooked till you got HelloFresh. No, I'm going to be honest. I'm not the best cook. And it's more because I, I can't, like, get all the ingredients, organize everything. It's a little difficult, especially in a time crunch with a family. But HelloFresh makes it so easy. It's America's number one meal kit. So you I didn't online, even know that. Yeah. You go online. It's you order what you want, you could plan out your meals for the week, and it's delivered right to your door. I know. When I got HelloFresh the other day, when you told me about it, I was like, let me just get it. Because the truth is, no one hates going to the supermarket more than the Marge. Mm -hmm. I hate running up and down the aisles. I happen to be a great cook. But this comes with all the ingredients, and you can make the best meal. It's all pre-portioned out too, so there's no waste. So you're not going to become like a real pork chop. This is great, and it's so nice. It's like Mr. B. I will say you could go on my Instagram. You could see the testimonials from him himself. He said he felt like he was in a restaurant all week because I served really interesting, inventive meals all week. Mr. B. was obsessed with the pork and gouda burger. I love the pork and oh, gouda yeah. burger. It's so great. You could change your delivery days if you know you have plans. You know, if you go on a vacation, you could even skip a week, and. It's good for all the family. Nino loves it too. And you can order in different portion sizes. I love I love that so much. So it could be two portions, four portions. And my husband's a big fatty, so I order the four po portions, even though it's only really us and Nino, but he's a big eater, so he likes to have extra. That's so good. I know. And Joe loved the pork and gouda burger. It was great. Really delicious. And I did some mushroom smothered chicken with mashed potatoes and carrots. Oh, it's so good. I'm just hungry talking about it. It was so good. I know. Good. And it does make it so easy. And the best part for me is that 
I don't have to go to the supermarket, up and down the aisles, think of new recipes. Because you know, listen, I have a nice little repertoire of recipes, but not like HelloFresh. So HelloFresh is the best, best idea. And by the way, it's perfect now. You don't have to see other people. Gets delivered right to your doorstep. It's so nice and easy. People will think you're like a gourmet chef. And, you know, for our listeners, we have a code. We do. So go to HelloFresh.com forward slash caviar80 and use caviar80 to get a total of $80 off. $80. Holy Jesus. $80. Exactly. That's a lot. Of and money. including free shipping on your first box. Free shipping. That's right. Additional restrictions apply. Visit HelloFresh.com for more details. So go to HelloFresh.com forward slash 80 and use code caviar80. That's caviar80 for a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Obsessed. You need this. You need it. You need it, people. Get cooking. You don't know what you're missing. Get cooking. I don't remember who it was. It may have been one of the Potomac ladies who called it me, but they started calling me the Olivia Pope of housewives because I would help them fix it. I, it was handled if I was taking care of it. So I really love that. That made me laugh like scandal, but you know, much easier. Yes, I know, which was great, which was perfect. And you know what? Then you get to go to a lot of fun events. Yes. I right. got to go to some filmings here and there, which was always so exciting to stand in the background. And you ladies, especially Dolores Catania, was the one who was like most guilty of this, would try to pull me into the drama. <laughs> oh, here's Dave. Dave, come here. Don't you want to talk about this and this on camera? <laughs> I, I know. Like, no, 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 no. I know. Del- I know. Dolores is so hysterical that way. She cracks me up. She's She'd always pull me in. I know. But She's so funny. There's always this part of me that's like a housewife fan who will never go away and who looks at the phone and is like, oh my gosh, so-and-so is calling me right now or so-and-so is texting me. It never gets, I never lose the bubble of what this is and how cool this is and how grateful I am to be the one that so many people come to and to talk to and to trust. Yeah, I know. Everybody, I always trust you, Joe. I'm like, oh, I'm going to call Dave. I'm going to see what's going on with Dave Quinn. Now tell me, you also, I mean, I'm sure for your dating life, you know, so tell me about like the dating life because you were single for a while. I was. I and was then you single. met the love of your life. It's crazy. I was single for like almost 15 years. I mean, 15 I really, years. You're yeah. so young. How old are you, Davey Quinn? Bless your heart. I'm, I'm 28. No, I'm, not, I'm, uh, I'm 38. I'm much older than you. Yeah. Look younger. You look. Thank younger. you so much. The, not Botox, but I wish. Um, it must. But I was single for a very long time, and then I met this uh, this dope <laughs> uh, named Gus, and it was crazy because <laughs> I feel like Gus just came in the room. Yeah. He did. It's like he knew I was talking about him. Um, single for 15 years, and it was very challenging. I'm sure that you've had this experience trying to balance like a, an emerging career, and I was very career focused with a dating life and I television really and movies really screwed me up when it came to love because I romanticize relationships like there was no tomorrow like I wanted everything to be like a movie and that's just like not the way it works and I think that through that experience I finally started recognizing that it wasn't going to be this perfect thing and I kind of let go of that I started to realize that I was okay with just being myself and that everything would be fine if I was alone this whole time. I stopped romanticizing that somebody would come along and save me. I think that a lot of people have that sort of experience. And that's I exactly think you're what right. I met Gus. <laughs> I know. Now where, did, now, where did you meet Gus? So he was, he's a stand-up comedian, amongst he, other things. Yes. And I, um, I went to go see a stand-up show. I was actually on a date with someone else. Ooh. And I went to go see his stand-up Dance show. Up. And, uh, and, and there he was. And I was like, that guy's really funny. And I sent him a message. I slid into his DMs. Woo. Was- Classic move. Classic. <laughs> Classic no, by move. the way, Gus, for everybody listening, is absolutely hysterical, brilliant, brilliant so, funny. so funny, die laughing. Like, I cannot get over how funny he is. Now, he really is. Very talented. 
Very talented. Yeah. Now, is he funny all the time, Dave? He is funny all the time, I have to say. But the the big thing for him was learning that I'm funny too. Yes, <laughs> and that yes. took him a little while. And I think a few of his friends have used this phrase before of, you know, two people can be funny in a relationship, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Is he like, wait, I'm the funny one. <sighs> My favorite thing about him, though, of all, is that he doesn't watch The Real Housewives. He's never seen an episode. He's not paying attention to any of it. So when he's been at events with me or, you know, he's like ran into people. I remember we ran into you at a restaurant one time randomly. Yes. He's always like, your friends are so nice. How did you meet them? And I'm like, they're huge television stars. <laughs> <laughs> huge TV stars. I know. He's so, I know. It was, it was funny because when you, we were having dinner that one night and he yeah. comes to dinner, he's like, yeah, I, I just... I never, I never watched you, but you are right. You're, you're right. I believe you, and I'm on your side. I know he was so cute. I was like, thanks, Gus. Thank yeah, you. It just isn't what he likes, and I think it's so important sometimes to have a partner who has completely different interests. I agree. There's no competition. You know, he respects the work that I'm doing. He's also a writer on a few television shows, so I really respect him when he's writing and when he's doing stand-up. We each really push each other to be better, which I love. It's we talk a lot about the fact that uh, we're a team and that we're helping each other on this team be the best team members we can. It's I cool. Know. I yeah. know, Very which cool. I absolutely love. Now, Dave Quinn, you, you have left people. I've temporarily left people, hopefully. I will temporary. hopefully be back. But yes, I- am um, on a temporary hiatus. I'm on a little temporary hiatus. I have to say, you don't know how big your dreams are until you start dreaming them. And I never thought that I would be at this point in my career where I would be writing for People Magazine, where I would see my name in print on stories, where I would be breaking major exclusives. The, the biggest thing was writing stories that would then go on the show. Like on the show, I remember Kenya Moore, I covered her, her separation from her husband, who they're now back together, I believe. But, and it was like a whole plot point this past season. And they're like reading my article. I mean, that is- That's a big deal. Yes, level. that's a big yeah. deal. That really takes me to a place as a fan of just being so excited. Um, and I, I've kept dreaming and I decided that um, it would be super cool to try to write a book. And I signed I a big that. book deal, which is amazing. And I'm now working on that. Well, Congrats. So, congratulations. Thank I you. cannot yes. wait to re read your book. It's I know wild. it's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> it is going to be a bestseller. It is. I will just tell you guys, it is in the Bravo sphere. So People who follow me or are aware of the work that I'm doing won't be surprised, I think, when it comes out. But um, it's really exciting and a great opportunity. And again, that desire of like being bigger than you think you can be. I never thought I could do this. And honestly, every day as I'm writing it, I still am like, when are they going to come here and take this away from me? Like, <laughs> I know. You know, I think a lot of it, that's what, he's the perfect caviar dreamer. It's true. I it's am. funny. Tom Hanks gave an interview recently. Yes. Where he discussed imposter syndrome, yes. which I feel like we, everyone has it. Like I, I do too. Do. I do, I have it all the time. Like, when also. do I get discovered that the gig is up? Like this was. Uh, I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> no, I know because I always feel like you know I'm just like the regular girl. I got you know married, da da da, and I feel like I'm always like playing house, and like someone comes over, you know, oh we're doing this, we're doing the driveway, we're getting the papers. I'm like, who are they talking to? Yeah. You know, I was like, I, I get my mom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you right. know, where's oh. the adult in the room? I always say that. Where's the adult? Oh, it's me. I'm the adult. I know. <laughs> I'm the adult. We're making these decisions, or we're doing this, or we're doing that, or it's so yeah. funny. Or, that's and like, the the thing for me was like there was this aha moment in my career when I f first walked back to a Broadway theater to see a show. And on the, I'm going to cry, on the marquee oh, you're was so my quote from a review that I had given and in my name on it, in big, huge letters. That's amazing. And then you started seeing that on the commercial and it was just like for a kid who loved theater, who loved show business, to find a place in the community in my own way, I can't do what you do, Margaret. I can't be a, a TV star. It would never you be could. what I You totally could. But like to be able to be myself and to be a part of it in some capacity, I feel really lucky that I'm part of this family. No, that's so sweet. No, you are. And everything you do is so important. And I always say, 
It's like everybody has like a cool role, but no, everybody knows you. Everybody has your phone number. Everybody, you know, loves your opinion. Everyone thinks you're, you know, you're so smart. And I was like, well, what does Dave Quinn think? And trust and respects you. Which in your industry is is a challenge, I'm sure. Yeah, because a lot of journalists are not well respected and looked at, you know, and you. Yeah, and you have integrity, and you're smart, and everything you write is well written, and and you're not looking to to hurt people. You're looking just to tell the story the right way. Yeah, and to help them. I mean, a lot of the job that we do is helping put into words what you're not ready to say, or to put into words what you maybe don't know how to say properly, and to give you a platform and to and to push a story forward that you may, you know, want to tell in a really uh, smart way that you don't have to kind of struggle with that yourself. And it also is, you know, you have to, you have to respect people to get their respect. You have to talk to people. Again, it's that retail thing. It all comes back to just treating people with kindness. And I think I've been lucky to do that, but I'm also not very competitive. And that's the big difference. Like I'm competitive to the sense that I, I want to be first with my stories and I want to have, you know, the exclusives, but I don't look down on other people for, achieving their corner of the sky because I personally believe that there is not a finite amount of success in this world. Everybody can achieve something. There's room for everyone at the table. So I don't look at other writers for other publications who are getting exclusives as my competition. I say, great for you. The, you know, the podcasters of the world who are starting great housewives podcasts, great for you. The bloggers like good for you because there's plenty of room for all of us. Everyone has value. I, you know, that's a great way to look at it. That's what I always say. Like, if your shining star doesn't dim someone else's. No. And that's exactly the way that I feel, too. Um, unfortunately, so many people don't feel that way and are total <laughs> douches about other people and feel competitive and, and try and keep you down. Right. And that's when I remind them of my housewife's tagline, which is, I may be a writer, but I can read a bitch. No. <laughs> That's such a good one. That's right. Now you have to be a housewife. Now you have to. Yes, you're an honorary housewife. That is the best tagline (laughs) I truly couldn't do it. I think you are all so courageous. I mean, I'm the sort of person, if you came up to me and punched me in the face, I would say, I'm sorry. I'd be like, I don't know what I did. I'm sorry. (laughs) So I think that you're courageous for being able to put this side of your life out there for all this scrutiny People are going to say things about everything about you, your appearance, your relationship, your choices. And if you're bold enough to do that and not, you know what I mean? Like that's impressive to me. No, it is. Listen, it's hard. I think it's hard because everybody likes to weigh in Mm -hmm. on everything in your life. And I think you you just get used to it. You have to have thick skin, right? And I think, but you too. I mean, because- People are making comments, you know, on everything you write and people are going to be like, Dave, I don't like what you wrote about me, you know, and everything like that, especially now that you're going to have a book, which is very exciting. Yeah. I think, you know, I know, have it's gonna, to say. I know it's going to be a New York Times bestseller for sure. Oh. And, I'm, and, and this is just going to be the first of many, which is super, super exciting. I mean, you're 38, you're not even freaking 40 years old yet. <laughs> Well, listen, I'm going to have a big 40th bash just like Melissa Gorga. I'm going to make you all come to it. There'll be pictures of myself all over. Yes, yes, it has to be. I'll give out t-shirts with my face on it. Yes, we're going to have to wear like t-shirts with you on it. By the way, I think I see Marge Sr. poking around in the back over there. Oh, there's. Hi, Marge Sr. Marge Sr. Here's Marge Sr. You send her my love. looks so cute. Here's Marge Senior. She's wearing Moffat Joseph's. Yeah, Marge Senior. Marge Senior, bend down, bend down, Marge Senior. Hi, Marge. I love you so much. Happy to see you. So happy to see you too. Marge Senior comes in, makes a guest appearance on the podcast. (laughs) Marge Senior looks cute. Are you doing a podcast with Dave? Yes, right now. They've run out of guests. (laughs) Yes. No, we no, we need no, good no, guests. No. We need good no, guests. No, it's it's all good. All right, Martin. Where's the little brat? Nina right, you look, look. Outside go outside. You look cute, Martin. See, Martin's been busy all through COVID. She's managed to work through this whole situation. 
I love it. And I have to just say, I mean, while we talk about business, while you talk about being a caviar dreamer, the other thing I'll say that I've learned throughout my career is that the path that I thought I would take, I never took. I, when I left Rhode Island working for these magazines, you know, I was running one of them. I was like, I'm going to get a job at People Magazine like that. And like, that didn't happen. I moved back here to New York. I didn't have a job. I started working in academic textbook publishing of all things, working on chemistry and physics college level textbooks. I've never even taken those courses in my life, but I kept <laughs> I using that idea of transferable skills. I can learn things here that can teach me about this. And from there, I started freelancing. I started my own blog. I started making connections. And the next thing I knew, I got a job working for Entertainment Weekly. And the next thing from there, I went to a startup doing you know, uh, reporting work and started my own thing. And then I came back and all of a sudden, there was an opening at People. And you just you keep saying to yourself, I know what I want and I'm going to keep trying to get there. This book is going to be amazing, but ultimately it's only one stop in the big picture. It is, Dave. That's it so is. good. That's such good advice for everybody listening who, yeah. who, want, who want to live their dream and their dream in journalism. And it is. It's about the big picture. But Dave, we have three questions mm -hmm. oh. that we ask everybody. Yes. And, you know, because the Marge says a lot of crazy things, but <laughs> one of the questions is, you know, I say you had to put a, pull up your big girl panties. Mm -hmm. What was one of your big girl panty moments where you're like, holy crap, you know, how am I going to do this? What was like one of your, I, have to, I better pull up my big girl panties and get this done? I think that my biggest big girl panties moment, you know, I was working on a very intense story about um, Catherine Dennis over at Southern Charm. I was doing a huge spread about her and her custody battle with her um, ex, Thomas Ravenel. Mm -hmm. And that was the hardest piece I've ever written in my career because I felt a huge amount of responsibility to help tell this story the emotion involved in any sort of custody battle while also navigating two people who truly hated each other and were spewing such negative things about one another. And I knew wanted to use me to be their mouthpiece. Um, that was really, really hard. And in the midst of all of it, I was going through some major personal things in my own life and it just felt like completely overwhelming, but to kind of pull together and get through that story um, to work with legal, which is a totally different aspect of being a journalist, like going over nitpicking things with lawyers, going through copy edits to make sure that every single word counts. And it is so hard to write for a magazine, you guys. Writing for the website, you could write as many words as you want. I had 853 words. Like you had to tell such a massive story in such a small amount of space. Wow. So, that was the hardest thing that I've ever done in my career, honestly. And that is. It was a really, it was a story that meant a lot to me personally. That is, that was, that was a very, very big deal. And yeah. now, and now he defends her. <laughs> right. right. And now, I mean, the truth is they're in a totally different place. He actually today just announced that he had a baby with another woman. I mean, a he's third child. I mean, this guy's a sperminator. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. I mean, so that was a really challenging story. For that sure. it, that yeah. was. So the march we always say is part delusion and part determination. She's about 50, 50 yeah, 50 determination, 50 delusion to get me the fake successful. Make it make it sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. To get me successful. Like I was delusional. I was like, yeah, I could do that. I could do this. I could do that. You know, I was like, of course, you know, because I'm delusional. And then I was also very <laughs> determined. So go ahead. Liz. What percentage determination to delusion are you? <laughs> I, I would probably be somewhat similar in, in that. I think you have to have a little bit of a delusion to, to have the gut so to do it. I remember when I first applied to Entertainment Weekly, they were hiring uh, just like an editorial assistant and I didn't get the job. And then a friend of mine said, you know, they're casting for this new video series they're doing where they're recapping television. Would you want to do something like that? I had never done on-camera work at all in my career. And I was like, I can do that. That's no problem. And that's how I got my job. I hosted that for like nine months, just recapping. We did three episodes of TV a night. And I was so delusional that I thought that I could go on and do that. Like I had never had any, on <laughs> ever. I never had read from a teleprompter. I never had written a show. We were writing the show too, but you have to kind of have, I think a little bit of that. So I'm going to settle on. I'm probably like 47% delusional. 
53 determined. 53 determined. I, I know. I'm reading from a teleprompter. People don't realize it's freaking hard. It's so hard. It is so hard. Especially I think it's that so hard. To be like, could you go slower, but you have to stay on a normal pace? Yes. Then but, it, it has to sound like you're saying it off the top of your head. And, you're, and you know. Right. And I always say and that's the one like thing. Read in. No, and Andy Cohen's so good at the teleprompter. Oh. So, well, he has so much experience, right? But go watch those early Watch What Happens live episodes. He is not as good at reading on the teleprompter in the beginning. He's learned through that experience. Yes, so by the way, I think we have to practice. There's a teleprompter app, by the mm-hmm. way, and we should practice on that. We should that. practice. We should give ourselves little training courses. Lexi? Much. I'm just going to tell you something. You know my cousin, Fran? I do. Do you know she had COVID? I did not. Well, she did, but maybe way. I should have stood more than six feet away from her when I saw her in the supermarket. No, that was after she could. Thank God. When you saw her taking all the ice cream sandwiches out of the boxes. Yes, that was strange. <clears throat> Dead serious, though, when I was at her house, her hair is falling out in clumps. That's horrible. And people who've had COVID, some women, who, I don't know about men, but I know women who've had COVID, some side effects after the fact, months later, hair is falling out. That's horrible. Thank God she has a lot of hair, but it's falling out in clumps, clumps, clumps. That's terrifying. She's crying. It's a train wreck, upset. So she was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? She went to the doctor. She's like, trying to take vitamins. I was like, Fran, forget all that crap. Take Nutrafol. Yes, Nutrafol. love it. I am obsessed. It's made my hair thicker. I know other people have taken it. It makes your hair thick. It seriously works, people. It makes your hair grow thicker and healthier. I was just bringing up my cousin Fran just because freak accident. She had COVID, lost clumps of hair. It is already helping her. I can't believe it. She sees some new hair growth. It's giving her new lease on life. But in general, Marcy and I have been taking Nutrafol. Yeah. Everybody complained, your hair's something, your hair's something, your hair's something. I, I was sick of hearing because I bleach my hair. So yeah. Nutrafol has given me thicker hair it healthier. It has all these vitamins. It's drug free, right? Yeah, it's, it's just totally drug free. Like it's based off the right amount botanicals. of botanicals. Botanicals, vitamins. It's amazing. Well, I just started taking it because my hair has been also breaking up in clumps because it's over bleached, and I could already feel a difference, even to like my sleep, the way I feel, my libido. Mister B is happy. I'm pouncing on him. It's helping in all different areas of my life. Well, very that, healthy. That is good to know. No matter what stage of life you're in, if you're young, if you're middle age, if you're a new mom, if you're older, if you were sick, whatever it is, Nutrafol really, it's, mm-hmm. it's a miracle letter. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show Yes, <laughs> by going to Nutrafol.com and using promo code CAVIAR. And new customers will get 20% off. This is their best offer available anywhere. 20% wow. off. If you go to Nutrafol.com. That's a great And saving. do the code CAVIAR. Plus, you get free shipping on every order. So you can get 20% off Nutrafol. Spelt N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com with the promo code CAVIAR. CAVIAR. C-A-V-I-A-R. Yes. So what's one thing? We always ask people, what's their most entrepreneurial like real advice, so entrepreneur real. Because right. we're very real people. We're not, you know, gonna tell people to write a business plan and we're like grassroots, get down and dirty. So right. what's your most real advice for anyone looking for a career in journalism? It's funny because you say about that like write down a business plan. I would never do that. I also am <laughs> I, know. I have to tell you, my key yeah. to my success, I don't pre plan questions ever in interviews. Even like that's book, impressive. The book that I'm writing right now is very interview centric, and I haven't re- pre written really any questions. I kind of beat out what I want to do and figure that the conversation will take us where we need to go. Um, I think the biggest, I mean, it's so silly, but like you do have to just trust your instincts, especially as a journalist. You have to trust that the story that you want to read is the story that you're going to write. Um, you got, it's so silly. Just start doing it. Just start writing. Everybody feels very intimidated. They feel like they need to figure out where they're going to go and find a space first. There's a, you have a Twitter account, you have an Instagram account, you have, you know, blogs that you can start so easily. Just start writing. The work will come. You will find the outlet. 
but be your own outlet. I love that. Bye. That's so good. Well, Dave Quinn, you I are. Talk to you forever. I know forever. I want to. I love you. I miss you. I know. So we much. love and miss you. Well, we could be together. You could come to New Jersey. I know. It's easier to eat here. It's. I think that it's is. easier. Uh, eating is not a problem I'm having these days. I will tell you, I've gained the COVID nineteen. <laughs> Me too. Oh, yeah. I'm a little pork chop. I just came from the doctor. I'm like, you know, I, I refuse the weigh in. <laughs> That's I'm very big much. with refusing the weigh in. A mutual friend of ours just had a tummy tuck, and I'll just say, I yes. wish. Oh, she looks. Oh, she's talking about it all over town. She looks unbelievable. <laughs> it's, I, I, Does Dolores not look great? Right? Yeah, she looks unbelievable. It's I know it's fair. sick. It's like the body of like a fifteen-year-old. Yeah. It's not she fair. Needs to cover Playboy. <laughs> I know. I said I to hate her. Dolores, That's why I went right to her doctor. That's who did my boob lift. Dr. Oh. Joseph, that's Dr. Joseph Michaels. No, she drove me. <laughs> I was like, Dolores, I will go right away. And no cameras around. Are you? Can you believe what we're missing? I know. How great that would be Same. for the season. Don't worry. I mean, that we'll get on the recovery and everything else. It's so <laughs> she's so hilarious, though. No, I mean, she was sending me photos on photos, and I was like, I have to go. We called the doctor. We drove together in the car. I mean, it was classic. Oh my God, you two are hilarious. Oh my I love God. that you've built such real friendships. Yes. That's, I think, the biggest challenge in my career is that sometimes you all hate each other and I like both of you and yes. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> um, not that you two ever hated each other. No, but no, no. We just had that fucking freak in the way. <laughs> Those days are gone. Those days are gone. She's gone to COVID Central. <laughs> yeah, maybe she took it with her. Yeah, she moved to Florida. She's moving to Florida. Oh, I mean, wow. That, that was one of my better weeks. Two weeks ago... I found out she was selling her house, Ziggy Flicker, selling her house, moving to Florida. I don't care. We're leaving that in. And Danielle was, um, you know, moved out of her house. Yeah. You had a double whammy. That's double good whammy. Shannon Freud. Yes. <laughs> really double, double whammy. New well, Jersey, no that, more stains on New Jersey. I think that they'll oh. have very successful oh. lives moving forward. Yes. Thank you. Well, Davey, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Love I love you. you. Love you. So much. Love you so much. Bye, Dave. Bye. Right, bye. Love you. Bye. How great was it to hear Dave Quinn's story? He had so much good business advice. Dave Quinn is absolutely amazing. He's had great business advice for anybody who wants to get into journalism. And look, it's dark outside already. We started in the sunlight, and now it's dark. It was <laughs> working to the bone. Working to the bone. Night. No, night, it was nine to five. No, it was or ten. Nine to five or ten at night. No, it was absolutely amazing. And I just love talking to him. And I met him while he was at People. I've learned so much about him. I know his fabulous partner, Gus. And they're just, they're a great couple. And I can't wait to hear what book he's writing, everything all about it. And everything he does is great. And he's such a good human. He is. And I love that he brought a lot of, you know, Every step along the way, he's picked up advice and he's taken it through his career. Like even started working at the Gap. Yes. I believe it. Sales training takes you a long way, people. Yes, sales training. It's all about the service and being good to humans and the experience. And listening. And listening. And Dave's a great listener. Great listener and delivering bad news with a smile. I love that. I'm all about delivering bad news with a smile. <laughs> hey. You're a fucking asshole. <laughs> and I do it with a big smile on my face. Oh, I love it. I love That's it. That's something we could see a lot from you next season on The Real Housewives of on New the Jersey. On The Real Housewives of New Jersey. Hey, douchebag. <laughs> You're looking quite cute today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we will have more Fabulous Caviar Dreamers back next week. Yes. Caviar Dreamers. With entrepreneurs, disruptors, leaders in the industry, risk takers, risk takers. This week we've had caviar dreamers seem to be on vacation this week. I know a lot of caviar dreamers taking a little. Well, I think now we're moving back from quarantine to like some sort of life in in this area. Everyone's a little screwed up. Yes, yes, and it's of course screwed. I was a little off my game just because I had my surgery. But that's good. The girls are going to be back in action. The girls will be back in action. Perky boobs means perky pigtails and perky march. Yes, perky march, pigtails, boobs, the whole nine yards. <laughs> so don't forget, tune in every Wednesday, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple. We will be there delivering you 
the best information. The best information. I don't know why you wouldn't want to listen because we have a lot of good things to say. Even if you don't like my accent, the things I'm saying are pretty good. So you better tune yeah, in. Exactly. It grows on you like mold. So get on. <laughs> so, so. Delivered with a smile. <laughs> yeah, delivered with a smile. Moldy smile. So get on it. Get on it, people. So follow us at Caviar Dreams Tuna Fish Budget on Instagram at the Real Margaret Joseph at the Life of Mrs. B. And keep dreaming. Keep dreaming, Caviar Dreamers. Till next week. Okay.